Welcome and thank you for joining the Williams Institute for a discussion about LGBTQ people on sex offender registries results from a national survey. So I want to begin by introducing all of our speakers and panelists for the day. So first I want to welcome Ilan H. Meyer, who's the Distinguished Senior Scholar of Public Policy at the Williams Institute. Well, welcome Ilan. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Lara Semple, who's the Assistant Dean for Graduate Studies and International Student Programs at UCLA Law. Welcome, Lara. And finally, I would like to welcome Tyrone Hanley, who's the Director of Racial and Economic Justice Initiatives at NCLR. Welcome, Tyrone. Thank you, Carly. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you, Lara and Tyrone, for joining me. Unfortunately, uh, Dominique could not make it. Um, we are going to discuss results from our survey and then um, have uh, some time for discussion and Q&A, and I would uh, love to hear uh, the uh, views of the people who are in our audience today. Uh, this is a part of a report that we are going to be make available online, publish it next week, probably on Tuesday. So I welcome you to look at that report when it comes out, because I'm only able to present a very, um, very, very few findings from a very extensive report. Um, I also um, want to thank all of the um, researchers, the research assistants, the investigators, and the community advisory board uh, who participated over the past few years in this project. I'm not going to spend the time to list everybody here, um, but uh, they're of course mentioned in the report and we will, and, and they have been all incredibly helpful. Um, including um, our funder, the Columbus uh, Foundation in uh, New York City. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to start with presenting some of the findings and then uh, Lara will present some findings specifically for the women uh, who were um, participants in our survey. Uh, so um, first, um, I wanted to start with some uh, context and a very brief history, very, very brief history of the topic. This is not an easy topic to discuss for many reasons. Um, on one hand, uh, we have a very long history of communalization of LGBTQ people. Uh, there are also uh, very complicated issues regarding their uh, registry and criminal justice system in general, and they're all both uh, difficult and complicated, and I hope we can have a good conversation uh, here, or at least start a good conversation here. Um, I don't know how many people know that, but uh, discussions about uh, registries have been um, a, a part of US uh, criminal justice system discussions for since the beginning of the 20th centuries at least, but California was the first to enact a registration law specific for sexual offenses. In 1990, Washington state uh, expanded this uh, to include uh, basically what we call a notification uh, in the sense that they um, uh, included uh, the dissemination of personal information in the registry. Since then, there has been a whole range of laws, uh, both for st states and federal, um, that have um, um, articulated various, um, uh, more and more stringent, I would say, uh, laws that uh, control the issue of sex offense registries. Uh, the 2006 uh, Sex Offender Registration Notification Act attempted to um, federalize uh, uh, or standardize at least across states some of those issues, including uh, um, establishing a national registration system where, where the state registrations are accessible, uh, expanding the number of registration eligible offenses, uh, required minors registered in certain instances, 
and created a, a three-tier uh, classification system that states were required to uh, um, um, abide by, uh, although the implementation of this uh, three-tier risk classification system is not certainly not complete yet and not without uh, uh, difficulties and problems. As you'll see um, in our presentation of results, uh, again, part of the context is that the United States has um, the world's largest prison population and uh, proportionally, as you see on the slide on the right from the sentencing project, uh, the most people incarcerated. Uh, there are about 2 million people incarcerated in the United States. In addition to that, there are about 900 people who are required to register as sex offense registries. So um, there, these people have completed their prison or jail term if they had one, and then are registered, as you'll see, for, for many, many years. Uh, and um, they are part of this system. Uh, overall mass, mass incarceration disproportionately affects people of color, people with disabilities and the LGBT community. And we're presenting today on both uh, LGBTQ people and straight cisgender people, Many of the issues apply to both, but there are some uh, special issues that apply to LGBTQ people. Um, as I said, sex offender registries have a long history and they've been controversial since they were first proposed. Proponents claim that the purpose is to improve public safety. Uh, that's obviously what you hear most often. But opponents have shown that registries serve a punitive purpose, but prevention public safety goals are not met by the registries. And I'll um, use this one quote from uh, two researchers who reviewed many studies in the field, in this area, mm -hmm. and concluded basically accumulated evidence largely rejects the, rejects the claim that SORN sex offense registry notification laws have achieved their goal of increasing public safety. So if we accept the research conclusions, uh, we're left with a very punitive system that um, at least uh, uh, researchers have shown does not serve a positive uh, public safety uh, goal. Specifically to LGBTQ people, uh, there's been a long history uh, within the criminal justice system, dating back to decades of criminalization of homosexuality through sodomy laws. And of course, even before that, uh, through religious uh, uh, institutions and um, uh, the canon law of the uh, uh, Catholic Church. Um, Gay people who have been involved in consensual sex with other adults were considered sex offenders. So when we use the term, we have to remember the variety of people who have been impacted. Uh, just two years ago, uh, Governor Newsom issued a posthumously, uh, a posthumous pardon to Ray Bayard Rustin, uh, who was of course the, um, a civil rights leader who worked with Martin Luther King and was an openly gay person, uh, um, even in the 50s and 60s, where many people were not out. And he was uh, charged in uh, 1953 uh, with consensual sex with other men and therefore required to serve 50 days in jail and register as a sex offender. As I said, Governor Newsom acknowledged that his charge uh, 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 was part of a criminalization of gay men and engaging in consensual sex acts, and he uh, uh, pardoned him. Um, policy makers have used the stereotype of the gay male pedophile, a stereotype that has been shown to be um, false, <laughs> uh, uh, and but has been used to gain uh, support in criminalizing the actions of LGBTQ people. And in recent months, I would say we've seen an even um, greater use of this language. We saw it in the hearing of uh, Justice uh, Ketanji uh, Brown Jackson, Ketanji Brown Jackson, where the whole question of her supposed leniency uh, came up. Um, 
And more recently, um, it has come up uh, in various uh, statements around the anti-LGBT legislation that is uh, uh, springing around the country. Uh, Michael Bronski in a recent uh, article um, quoted uh, Governor DeSantis spokesperson, post spokesperson sorry, who said the bill that liberals inaccurately call don't say gay, she says, would be more accurately described as an anti-grooming bill. And Bronski says, a blatant appeal to homophobia, she was referring to the myth that homosexuals groom or recruit children to become homosexuals so they can have sex with them. So this is an important part of the context in which we talk about uh, sex offense registries and the kind of stigma that is attached to LGBTQ people in that uh, uh, context. So I want to talk a little bit about some results from our study. Uh, we conducted a survey that was self-administered uh, between March and November 2020 with 965 volunteer respondents. And uh, we um, asked people who were required to register to participate this uh, survey. We reached people through announcements and multiple platforms, including advocacy organizations, uh, reentry programs, public defender offices, treatment facilities, and of course, social media. Uh, even in announcing this study, we were receiving uh, hate messages from people, uh, a kind of vigilante hate messages telling us that we shouldn't even uh, do a study like that. Uh, we were able to reach people across the country and um, we um, unfortunately were not able to reach sufficient number of um, Black and Hispanic respondents. Uh, black, respon black people are overrepresented in the registry, but, so they're underrepresented in our sample. Um, our sample as a whole is not a representative sample, and that should be a caution in thinking about our results. But at the same time, it provides important insight from, for the first time, a group of LGBTQ people who are uh, required to register. Um, the average age was 50, and uh, we had 96% were uh, men, 3.2% uh, uh, cis men, 3.2% uh, were cis women, and less than 1% were transgender. And 20% of the sample were LGBTQ. Um, we did not do anything specific to call for LGBTQ individuals, so this is a quite high proportion that we received in this volunteer uh, 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 respondent in the survey. Um, in terms of the characteristics of the sample, um, unemployment was very prevalent, uh, about 30%. And here you see some differences between uh, LGBTQ in the orange and the straight gender respondents in uh, the blue bars. Uh, but overall, um, this is characteristics of uh, people on sex offender registries because of the many barriers that they have, employment is uh, one of the most difficult areas that they uh, confront. And we see high proportion of people who are self-employed, which is one uh, tactic that people have been able to use uh, if they can achieve that to uh, be able to survive. Uh, still 42% of the respondents have income below 200% of the federal poverty level. This is very high comparing to 25% of the general population. So very high levels of poverty uh, related probably to those issues that uh, I described regarding employment. In terms of interactions with the criminal justice system, 6% had an additional sex offense following their first incident uh, for which they were required to register. This is not a proper or at least accurate measure of recidivism, but I would note that it is consistent with the number that was published by the Department of Justice, which uh, um, showed um, about 6% uh, recidivism for same-sex offense conviction and arrest, um, which was, by the way, the lowest uh, of many other uh, uh, um, 
convictions. 9% uh, of the LGBTQ respondents had a sodomy statute included in their offense. Uh, that doesn't mean that they were charged uh, only with a sodomy statute, but it was enhanced, enhancing their, their whatever conviction they had. And 2% had a HIV diagnosis that was also included in their uh, charge, uh, in their um, conviction as an aggravating uh, factor often. Uh, one third of the LGBTQ and straight gender adults had a victim that was younger than age 12. Other victim characteristics, this is victims that were um, uh, defined by the legal system as we were reported by the respondents themselves. Um, so for one difference was for LGBTQ respondents, there were uh, a lot more uh, people whose uh, victim was represented in an image. We say that because uh, uh, pornography uh, represents a victim, but the victim did not have, or the, the, the person did not have a contact with that victim in the case, and that's why we refer to an image. Uh, in about 10%, uh, the uh, victim was a, a impersonating a minor, an officer, and for um, straight respondents, uh, about 39% uh, had a family member who was identified as the victim. Um, in terms of uh, other interactions with the criminal justice system, less than 10% of the respondents had gone to trial. Most respondents pleaded guilty or no contest, and about one third were convicted of a reduced offense. Uh, more LGBTQ than straight gender adults were incarcerated in prison. And more LGBTQ than straight gender people reported sentences of 25, for year, 25 years or more in prison. Uh, so that's 5% versus 1.6%. 45% 5 uh, of the responses were required to register for 25 years or more. This was the most uh, common result and uh, only 5% were required to register for less than 10 years. So uh, most frequently people were required to register for 25 years or more. 8%, only 8% had been removed from the registry by the time uh, they responded to the survey. As you know, this is very um, hard, although not impossible that people would be removed uh, from the registry over time. Um, this uh, leads to um, a sense of hopelessness um, and, and also a lot of um, uh, um, confusion uh, or, or lack of understanding or less of clarity, I would say, in the system about what is required, who is required to do what and for how long. Uh, so this respondent said, uh, uh, what little hope I might have had was vanished since I've registered. I have to register for life and there is no provision to be taken off the registry. I have no hope for redemptions at all. The road is a dead end for me, literally. I only get taken off the registry when I die. In terms of collateral consequences, this is uh, what uh, researchers call the impact of the registry on people's lives. I think the word collateral consequence is somewhat of a misnomer because many of the consequences are in fact the, uh, 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 what the law requires. So it's not collateral in the sense that um, unintended, this is the intended uh, effects uh, of the um, registry, making it very hard. In particular, I mentioned employment and housing. Uh, most of our respondents reported losing a job due to being on the registry, 56% and almost a third reported having been denied a promotion. 30% said they changed jobs once or twice in the two years prior to the survey. And of them, 27% of the straight gender respondents and 39% of the LGBTQ respondents said they were terminated from their job due to being on the registry. 20% um, of the respondents changed jobs because they were harassed on the job. So they, um, impact of registry, either through stigma or through uh, other uh, um, uh, elements of the law are quite uh, significant in the area of employment. This was very typical replies, responses that people wrote. By the way, these quotes come from the survey where people were given the opportunity to add narratives to the 
mainly a multiple choice type of questionnaire. Uh, so this um, uh, transgender uh, person, 36 year old said that any work I was trained in with technology is now untenable and the trauma of being in prison as a trans woman along with the horrific treatment on probation and registration has made functioning in society almost impossible. Uh, a, a different person also happens to be transgender. I received six job offers, all of whom were rescinded the offer after learning that I'm registered. Extremely fortunate to have the job now. I have now, I have a strong resume. Most people who wrote something were talked about how the job that they're able to get is well below the level of job that they should have gotten if it weren't for being uh, registered. Uh, the other area of quote-unquote collateral consequences uh, is housing. Again, um, people uh, reported, half of the people reported unable to, being unable to live with supportive family due to the restrictions uh, of the registry. Um, half of the people, uh, more somewhat more LGBTQ people said they were refused, uh, 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 Leonard refused to rent to them because of the registry, because they were on the registry. And um, almost two thirds of the people said that they were, they had difficulties finding a place to live that was not too close to school, bus stop, park or playground, which are uh, restricted by the registry. Uh, again, this all depend on state and local laws. So there's not uh, necessarily the same everywhere, but uh, you can see that most people are severely impacted by those uh, restrictions in terms of housing. Um, this is another, uh, a couple of other quotes. Uh, because of the registry, I have not been able to move out of my, out on my own due to the fact that everyone everywhere does a background check. Therefore, being 37 year old, it's been quite the burden on myself and my parents having to live with them. Uh, and this is a, also an example of how families are impacted very severely by the registry. Um, and needing, having, uh, or wanting to help their uh, loved ones uh, in and and finding it, uh, all these restrictions, uh, of course, um, make life very hard for the families. Uh, and this uh, other respondents in New York City, anyone that is um, placed on the registry for life is banned from applying for New York City housing, HPD, and other federal housing programs. I don't know how prevalent that is, or honestly, I haven't checked the accuracy of this, but maybe Tehran can help us later if, if you know. Uh, uh, but I know that uh, there was a civil rights commission that uh, also addressed the issue of uh, public housing for people on the registry. Uh, so I know that this is um, uh, true for many people. Uh, in terms of other collateral consequences, um, violence and harassment, um, Many people, uh, it's almost a normal occurrence to be insulted and verbally abused uh, due to the stigma uh, of being on the registry, um, threatened with violence, attempted uh, attack or damaged property, robbed or property damaged, uh, object thrown and physically assaulted. Um, again, you see uh, these are very uh, frequent occurrences for people on the registry. Uh, we asked specifically about events that were caused by the registry and um, uh, half the people, more than half, said they were harassed in person. Another close to half, 45%, said they were harassed by uh, calls, emails, flyers or notes. Um, most people, uh, three quarters, lost a friend who, when the friend found that they were on the registry. Um, Many people were asked to leave a business or restaurant and um, close to two thirds were denied contact with children or family members. Um, again, um, part of the requirements of the registry in terms of monitoring the person's contact with children uh, requires uh, uh, some people to be separated from their own children. Um, Another a few more quotes. Uh, it's like a hammer hanging over my head every day. I'm just waiting for the day when the hammer falls and someone murders me because I'm on the registry. Uh, this is the feeling that conveyed um, 
in the context of this quote unquote collateral consequences. Uh, brought back memories of similar harassment during my colleges when I word got out that I was gay. And um, this 31 year old man says, fear and shame controls my life. Um, looking forward to discuss these issues and some of the implications of these issues. Um, as I said, I was just presenting some of the data without getting into the um, actual policy implications that I hope we can talk about. But there has been a lot of uh, attempts to change the law, not successful so far. This is a currently um, attempt by the SLU filed in Michigan. As you see from the headline there, civil rights organization says it's unconstitutional to label people for life without individual review. And that's reflecting the difficulty of getting off the registry, I think. Um, as well as some of the application of the law to people retroactively. So with this, I'm gonna turn it uh, over to um, Lara who will present some of the results on the uh, group of women that we studied. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan. I will pull up my slides. I'm Laura Stemple. I'm the Assistant Dean of Graduate Studies at UCLA School of Law, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, as my slides are not advancing. There we go. Um, as Ilan mentioned, we have a large number of respondents, the vast majority of whom or cisgendered men. And so I'm gonna be talking mostly about women, a little bit about the seven transgender respondents that we had. I think it's really important to disaggregate in this way um, because uh, even things that are quite common for women might be drowned out when looking only at um, the numbers in the aggregate. So first of all, I think it's really important to note that almost all surveys of people on sex offender registries um, have focused exclusively on men. Only a small handful have looked at women. Um, of those prior surveys, the uh, sample size has ranged from nine to 106 women. Um, between zero and 7.7% of women respondents were identified as black, indigenous, or persons of color. And that compares with 20% um, with for the women who responded to our survey, slightly higher proportion than um, than uh, in the total as Elon presented, um, though of course um, it's a critical issue because as Elon mentioned, the overrepresentation of BIPOC people in prison is, um, is noteworthy. So previous surveys have looked at one or two states. We had 18 um, different states represented in this subpopulation. Um, prior studies on women have not included any information at all about sexual orientation and notably 29% of the women who responded to this survey identified as LGB, so that's even higher proportion than the total. Turning to transgender persons, two out of seven of our respondents identified as BIPOC, five out of the six who answered the question identified as LGB, and all respondents who identified as trans were assigned male at birth. In other words, no trans men responded to our survey. So the transgender folks who did respond identified themselves as genderqueer, non-binary, gender non-conforming, or simply as transgender. Um, none chose to identify as women, and we did not put them in the category of women. So here you can see that a somewhat higher proportion of men reported having a, a college degree as compared to women. Um, and women and men were roughly equally um, falling below 200% of the federal poverty level um, in terms of their income. But I wanna show you something interesting that happens. When you zoom in, imagine this, uh, the bar on the left most of the screen. And when we uh, disaggregate by race, what we see is that even though um, BIPOC women were more likely to have a college degree than white women, they were nevertheless in poverty much more often than white women. And this is a pattern that you'll see uh, across the slides I'm gonna to present to you today, the disadvantage that BIPOC women um, are reporting. Around half of transgender respondents reported an associate's degree and around three quarters reported living below 200% of the federal poverty line. 
As you can see here, since being on the registry, women more often than men reported that they were hit, beaten, physically attacked, or sexually assaulted, whereas men more often than women reported that they had their property robbed, stolen, um, damaged, or vandalized. Uh, and um, again, zooming in on the uh, differences, we see that there's a more dramatic difference by race among women than we saw between women and men. BIPOC women uh, much more often re reported um, assault. And if you look to the right of the slide, you can see that BIPOC women and BIPOC trans persons reported more harm than their white counterparts, including being verbally insulted or abused, being threatened with violence, or having had an object thrown at them. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the patterns we've seen, BIPOC women more often reported only poor or fair health, and BIPOC women reported psychological distress much more frequently than white women. Women more often reported suicidal ideation than men, and they were more likely to report a suicide attempt. Especially troubling, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, every single transgender person who responded to these questions said that they had both thought about suicide and had attempted suicide. So I want to acknowledge that this is devastating. So this is the first of a number of slides that I'll read with, uh, reflecting our participants' own words. Um, some of these are tough to hear, so I want to acknowledge that. I attempted suicide shortly after being convicted. This is an unending nightmare I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I want to die so fucking bad every day because they took my life from me for losing my virginity during consensual sex. Respondents reported legal restrictions, financial barriers caused by the registry, um, and the need to frequently reflect, rely on other people for housing. So for example, they wrote, I can't live a thousand feet from schools, daycares, parks, even dog walks. In the past 15 years, I have not been able to get a job to help me move from my mother's house. I lived primarily under the radar off the lease. Setting legal restrictions aside, um, many landlords just on their own simply refused to rent to respondents. And this shows another example of BIPOC women facing the greatest burden in this regard. I feel very insecure when I have to look for different housing. I have had potential landlords scream at me in fear and bring muscle to protect themselves when meeting me. We also found that 13% of women reported they had only temporary housing and 6% were unhoused. Nowhere to live. Most shelters only take men and no women. Nowhere for single mothers to go. I have never had stable housing. Turning to employment, um, as you can see here, BIPOC women and BIPOC men more often lost jobs due to the registry with BIPOC women again faring worse. I have been denied employment several times due to a sex offense conviction that is almost 20 years old. Prevents me from simply living. There's nothing for me to do but isolate or work as a prostitute for money. We didn't have a survey question about the effects on children and families, but as Elon mentioned, a number of uh, respondents did write to us about this. I always cry myself to pieces thinking about when I lost my kids. My daughter, I see it affecting her greatly, wondering why other moms come to the school and I don't, drive past a park and she can't play, so much more. Respondents also wrote about their experiences with shame, stigma, and hopelessness. I don't bother dating, I'm ashamed of my background and would not like to reveal it. It often seems like being an RSO, registered sex offender, is viewed more harshly than murder. My life is a living nightmare. So 
So again, as a reminder that 29% uh, of the women in our survey identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, um, I wanted to read you this somewhat detailed, but I think um, vivid and poignant story from one woman. I had consensual sex for the first time with my girlfriend, who was three years younger than me when I was 17. We talked about it ahead of time and why we wanted to do it and how we felt about each other. And later on, her father caught us. I literally cannot finish the story without having a PTSD flashback. So you can fill in the shitty little plea deal my lawyer arranged for me that avoided the prison time I was terrified of and ruined the entire rest of my life. I will likely kill myself because of it. Convicted of stat rape, never had stable housing, nor employment for more than a month. Transgender respondents also shared a great deal of pain. The first quote was actually in Elon's presentation, so I'll skip to the second one. I can't work. I doubt housing will work because of the registry. All I am is a useless, rotting corpse. So turning to reasons for conviction, um, I'd like to note that some of the most dramatic differences we saw throughout the survey um, when disaggregating by sex appeared when examining the reasons that respondents were convicted and ultimately assigned to the registry. So as you can see here, men more often reported child pornography um, and child molestation than women. In contrast, women were more often convicted on prostitution related charges or of sexual victimization of someone between the ages of 14 and 17. None of the women in our survey had three or more victims compared to 11% of men. So this brings us to the topic of recidivism among women sex offenders. Um, and other researchers have consistently shown again and again, there are very low rates of sexual recidivism among women between one and 3% approximately. And states themselves, as Ilan mentioned, use instruments that take a range of factors into account in order to try to determine who will recidivate so that they can put those people on registries. Um, and that's, I think, problematic regardless of the sex or gender of the person who is being put on the registry. Um, but to highlight the circumstances for women, I think it's worth noting that, that none of the instruments that were created were designed for women. And, that, and those who created the, the instruments themselves will tell you that. Um, moreover, uh, other studies that have been done of those instruments have found that they are terrible at predicting uh, which women will reoffend. So despite this total lack of predictive power, states are still using, uh, some states are still using these instruments and, um, and using them to put women on registries. Uh, to finish, I'd like to share some quotes that sum up the feelings of deep frustration that so many of our respondents have shared with us. It is a 25 year long sentence for a crime I have already paid for. It is unfair, unjust, ineffective, and should be abolished. It's made me feel hopeless that no matter how perfect I live my life, it doesn't matter. There is no finish line. Thank you very much. Now we turn to Tyrone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Tyrone Hanley. I'm Director of Racial and Economic Justice Initiatives at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. I use he and him pronouns. And first, I just want to thank Williams Institute for doing this research. I think that in addition to gathering really important information, I think it makes a lot of people in our communities feel seen who um, don't feel seen, or when they do feel seen, it's not for a very good reason. I also want to thank the people who are on this call who have been doing working on this issue for a lot longer than I have. I know that you know me entering into this works in part due to the work that you all are doing, and so I just want to thank you um, for that. So. I just want to first start off our, our, my comments saying why am I engaged in this issue in my role at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Um, first of all, I just want to, at NCLR, we understand that as an organization that's very committed to advancing the well-being of LGBTQ people in this country, that we need to be focusing on issues impacting the people who are the most marginalized, 
even within our own community. And so that means people who have been convicted of sex offenses um, and people who are on the registry. Um, also for me, it's very personal. You know, I'm someone who first started exploring my sexuality at a very early age as a child. And I know that if I had been caught, it's very likely that I could have ended up in a lot of trouble in particular because the other children that I was engaging in sexual expo exploration with were white and I am a black person. And so I'm very clear that I could have easily, you know, fallen into the system. And also I'm someone who enjoys engaging in sex in public spaces. And so these issues do directly impact me. And I know that I can't see myself as separate from this issue. Um, and so I think for me, it's really important to be engaged. And then also it's really important despite Lawrence v. Texas, and we can get to that later, that queer and transsexuality is still criminalized in our society. And that is a, is a one factor that causes our people entering into the criminal legal system, which is very violent against all people, but particularly against queer and trans people. Um, and so it's for this reason that I co-founded the sex offense policy subgroup with Getting Bobman, who, who may be on the call, um, may be listening in, um, over five years ago um, through the National LGBTQ HIV Criminal Justice Working Group. We have renamed the group to, um, to queer and trans people for sexual justice, excuse me, for sexual justice. So I kind of want to first start off some of my reflections working on this issue in the last five years. And again, these are my personal reflections and I acknowledge that, you know, they're limited because they're my own, but I do think that they are informative about where we are on this issue. Um, first, I think it's really hard working on this issue because we don't, there's not a base of people who are focused on this within the LGBT community, within the criminal justice movement, and just by and large. And so when you go to lawmakers, you know, it's really hard to convince them to care about this. You know, I've met with staffers, um, you know, they may have been understanding, but I knew that those conversations weren't really going to go anywhere. And I remember when we first started working on this issue um, through the subgroup, and we would meet with the Obama administration and we would have all this really rich conversation about all these issues related to queer and trans people in the criminal legal system, incarceration, HIV criminalization. But as soon as we got on this subject, you would just feel the wind completely suck out of the room. And so you felt the shame, you feel the sense of um, anxiety around the subject. So it's a very hard issue to do advocacy in. Also, it's really sad to see that we see time and time again that criminal justice advocates, reformers, constantly throw people who are convicted of sex, offense, sex offenses under the bus. Every time there's some law to reform our sex offense, you, I'm sorry, our um, criminal legal system in some way, almost always there's an exemption for people convicted, convicted of sex offenses and maybe people um, who have been convicted of murder which goes to show you how deep this runs in our society that we associate that sex offenses are on par with actually taking someone's life. So I think that is something to really sit on as, you know, as we kind of really process where we are as a society on this issue. Also, to be honest with you, I have seen, you know, organizations specifically focus on registry reform, lack a a racial analysis. And so I think it makes it hard to bring in criminal justice advocates who are focused on mass incarceration. We don't see folks talking about how by and large the prison industrial complex is really directed at um, people of color and that this issue obviously is a part of that. And then also just seeing that LGBT groups don't want to touch this issue. And I understand why. I mean, you know, Elon referenced the fact that, you know, queer and trans people for a long time have been labeled as sexual predators. So I think it comes from a place of shame and also trauma. But again, it makes it really hard to do the advocacy in this work. And I think one of the things that's really important in moving forward that we're really going to have to figure out a way how to build a broad coalition to focus on this issue. And it brings in so many different people and um, movements because without that, I think it would be hard to move it forward. 
So now I kind of want to get on, get into like how um, queer and trans people are currently criminalized. And so this is a little bit broader um, on the subject of sex offense registry, because some of these issues may not necessarily lead you to get onto um, a registry, but they're part of a broader process in which the law criminalizes um, human sexuality, um, and particularly queer and trans people. And so the first one, you know, when it mentions the fact that the police, you know, despite how many more decades before, are still entrapping people who are seeking out same-sex partners in cruising either parks um, or bathrooms in our society. And the fact that here in Washington, D.C., back in 2018-19, I believe, there was news stories that the park police were going to very famous a well-known cruising park um, here in the District of Columbia and entrapping men who were just simply looking for sexual partners. Um, that is the same, that same location is a place that I myself have engaged in sexual behavior. So I could have easily been one of those people. And so for me, this issue is like very personal um, when I think about it on that level. Then also there's this reality of close in age exemptions. And so what we see is like basically under age of consent laws usually states basically say like, if you technically are above the age of consent and the person you have sex with is under the age of consent, that if you're within this age range, that it's okay. But that also means that there could be um, some opportunities, for example, like if you don't fall into that and you're just above that and you're, let's say your partner, like you're a gay person and you have someone, let's say you're like, you just graduated from high school and maybe your partner is still in high school. And then the younger parents find out about, you know, that relationship. A lot of times what we find our parents then use the law to try to protect their child and to get their child's boyfriend or girlfriend into trouble and call the cops on them. We also have data that shows that people are more like are more willing to convict um, people of these offenses if it's a same sex situation in a different sex situation. So you see that bias with built in into the system. Then we also know sex workers. Sex workers continue to be profiled by the police, um, including trans people who may not even be sex workers still may be profiled by sex workers uh, as sex workers um, by the police. And so we know that because of so much discrimination against particularly trans people, a lot of our community, you know, end up in sex work in order to make ends meet. And so through criminalizing sex work, the law continues to criminalize queer and trans people, even in, as we're just trying to survive um, in a world that's very, um, you know, anti us, be able to be who we are. Um, and then also there's HIV criminalization, you know, um, while some research shows that necessarily it's not always gay people who get ensnared by these laws, that it obviously does include um, LGBTQ people who are HIV, who have HIV and who are sexual and their partners may be upset with them that they have HIV and report them to law enforcement. And then finally, I want to stay on this issue is around LGBTQ youth who end up in the juvenile justice system. Williams put out great um, important information showing that a lot of young people, particularly for young, for young women, are young women of color. And so when you're in these systems, you're, you, you're under the eye of the, of the state. And so that means that normal sexual behavior that young people engage in as they're exploring themselves and their bodies, then it can become criminalized because you have adults watching and saying like, hey, no, this is not something you're supposed to be doing. So I raise all these issues to say that the criminalization of queer and transsexuality has not gone away post Lawrence. Like it has continued to happen throughout this entire time period. So that brings us to the top of Lawrence v. Texas. So I'm sure all of you have heard <laughs> that unfortunately that Supreme Court is looking to overturn Roe. And while that in itself is very scary, I think also it means for people who may not necessarily be thinking how their own lives are impacted by that issue, that many of us who are queer and trans could be impacted because that also means Lawrence v. Te Texas also could be under threat because it comes under the same type of constitutional um, theory. 
And so that means what we could find ourselves in a world in which more conservative areas are going to try to use it as an opening to begin to once again, in an even more expansive way than I already highlighted, to really go after queer and trans people simply for um, expressing their sexuality. So either they may try to enforce laws that technically right now are would be deemed unconstitutional, they may just go back and try to enforce them, or they may put new laws onto the books. And so I think that for me, it wasn't, you know, while I'm someone who has been really thinking about this whole concept of abolition, which means fighting for a world without prisons and police and a carceral system, that it really wasn't until this year, I mean, until this past week with news around Roe that I really solidified my view that a part of queer and trans liberation is ending the presence of police and jails in our society. And the reason why I say that is that I think that a lot of us as queer and trans people, particularly those of us who don't fall into those categories I was talking about, may find like, you know, the police are not harassing me, they're not bothering me anymore, they're no longer my problem, in fact, they keep me safe. That I think that these moments really challenge us to really think about what systems we are investing in, and that while maybe in the moment they make us feel safe, that I think in the end that these systems have a way to find themselves back to us. And so I think that I suspect that a lot of queer and trans people right now are really thinking about the carceral system and about like how that could potentially impact us and like why we need to be a part of a movement to dismantle these systems. Um, and then finally, I also think it's really important to note that this is a really important intersection of race and that like if we see you know parts of this country are really moving back into a world in which they're actively trying to criminalize queer and trans people for our sexuality that it's going to be queer and trans people of color who are going to bear the brunt of that and so for that i think that this is a moment of action for all of us i think first of all get out on those streets um, and to fight it back against his attempt to um, ban abortion in our country. I think also this means that we need to start re-examining or examining our own biases and shame over our own sexual sexuality and views on policing in our society. I think this also means that we need to be open about our own sexuality. I think in these moments, it could be so easy to kind of go back in the closet. These are the moments we must be claiming our sexuality and say there's nothing wrong about being a queer person who likes having queer sex, whatever that means to you. Because I think in those moments, it's really important in terms, of, I think that that light on our sexuality, which is very beautiful, really is a way to kind of fight back against this attempt to shame us for our own sexuality. And then finally, I just want to say, if you're interested in getting involved with queer and trans people for sexual justice, please email me at thanley at NCL rights, because we definitely need you in this and look forward to you getting involved because we need more people. So thank you so much. And thank you to Williams for having this conversation and doing this research and for everyone for joining us. I'm turning back to you, Elon. Thank you, Tyron. That was really impactful. And, and um, I always love hearing <laughs> what you have to say. And thank you, Laura. That was also really, you know, I get goosebumps sometimes when I hear those um, quotes because it is just so painful to listen to. Um, I think one point that you mentioned, Tyrone, about the reluctance of LGBT organizations, and as you said, it's both understandable because we're subject to stigma and discrimination and, and violence ourselves, and we sometimes have the instinct to separate ourselves from those type of things that are most stigmatizing regardless of the fact that the stigma is not justified by any facts, by any data, by any, you know, has been refuted for, for decades, you know, that dear gay men are pedophiles and, and, you know, but it's still, it's still scary for us to talk about it. I know even in, in, in kind of private conversations with, with uh, other gay friends, I feel kind of like um, I have to explain a lot why, why I do that. And so I just want, I just hope that one result of this uh, will be to, for people to note the, the, the strong stakes that LGBT people have in this. And um, 
and and that hopefully we can um, um, continue to work on those issues. I know that we have a lot of comments and uh, questions. Um, Ira had a question about the uh, image uh, victim that um, I would think I would be happy to answer you in an email. He was asking about the, 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 the doing a national survey like that is very complicated because of course, you know, each state has its own laws and we have very detailed data on terms of the convictions and crimes, but sometimes it's a little harder to aggregate the data in a way that I can answer this question about, um, I think everybody can see the questions right on the Q&A, but uh, um, it does appear that more uh, of the LGBTQ people had um, um, image uh, as a victim, let's put it at this point. Um, I think um, um, in terms of the um, presentation that Lara gave, I think like, like it was really important to note and I would add a note on that. Our report that we will publish on Tuesday aggregates all of the people looking at LGBTQ versus uh, straight cisgender. We are working on uh, two other reports. One of them looks specifically at collateral consequences and analysis by race ethnicity across the board. And another report is the one that Laura is leading on women. And of course, each of these gives us a, a, a different view of this larger uh, um, topic. Um, I don't know, Lara, if you want to say anything in closing. I don't know if we have enough time to answer any specific question, but maybe I'll just uh, let Lara uh, one minute and Tyrone, you'll have the last uh, word if you don't mind. So Lara, and I don't know if you've seen some of the questions. Uh, again, I would say um, everybody is welcome to email me and I can forward the email to Lara and Tyrone if you don't have it. I put my email in the chat and we will have our, um, this recorded um, um, presentation online as well. Uh, Lara, do you want to say anything? Just in one small point before we close. And yeah. thank you for all the questions. I wish we had a lot more time to discuss. Yeah, we um, should. Yeah, you know, an important point is that what we, one thing that we know about preventing recidivism. So if the, if the goal of these registries is purportedly to prevent these crimes from happening again, what we know is that the things that prevent recidivism are having people have strong relationships within their communities, to have employment, to have a place to live. And these are all the very things that the registry itself prevents. I think we missed that point. So I really wanted to underscore it because not only is it perhaps not effective, it may indeed be counterproductive to reducing recidivism overall. Yeah, very important point. Tyrone, do you have a last point? Sure, I think my last words is that while we must be committed to addressing sexual violence and abuse in our society, that prisons and jails will not set us free. That what will set us free is building community with one another and dismantling all these walls that divide us. And so I really hope that this moment that you all are really thinking about how you can build those bridges and because we need a broad coalition to ensure that all people are able to be free in our society. And thank you so much for joining us and thank you for everyone for working on this issue if you're out there working on it.